Good morning. Welcome to worship at St Andrew Blackadder Church. It's lovely to see you all here in the church building and a special welcome if you're a visitor with us today. Also welcome if you're worshipping online with us or if you're at home with the DVD. Please stay for tea and coffee at the end of the service if you can. That's in the High Street entrance, which is through those doors at the back of the church and down the stairs. Activities coming up in the next week or two are printed on the back of the order of service. And just to say thank you to everybody who helped at the Guild Coffee Morning, which was yesterday. They raised £795, which is fantastic. So thank you to everybody who was involved in that. It's Holy Week this week coming up, and we've got communion being served here on Thursday evening. And on Good Friday, we're over at Abbey Church for the service there. Both of those services are at half past seven in the evening. And next Sunday being Easter Sunday, the clocks go forward, just a wee reminder. So it's an early start for everybody, but we look forward to seeing you all there for that. Thank you to Neil, who's leading us in worship this morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 118. I'll say the words in yellow if you would like to respond with those in white. Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God. With bows in hand, You are my God, and I will praise you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let's join together as we sing, Make way, make way for Christ the King. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have shown your tender love for us by sending your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to live a life in this world and to suffer death on a cross to save us from our sins. Help us to live in gratitude for his sacrifice 
reflecting his love and grace in all that we do. Lord Jesus, on this Palm Sunday, we remember your triumphant entry into Jerusalem, arriving to shouts of joy and cries of Hosanna. You came as our Messiah, not as a conquering king, but as a servant, humbly riding on a donkey. You knew the path that lay ahead of you, yet you were willing to exchange your crown for a cross. Saviour, Redeemer, we join in the acclamation of the crowd and the welcome of the children in praising you this day. We lift up our voices in glad hosannas, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We joyfully acknowledge you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We remember, too, how quickly that welcome of long ago evaporated, how soon the mood of the crowd changed to that of rejection. And we know that we are not so different. Our commitment is often short-lived, our faith weak and shallow. We are selfish and self-centered. Yes, we are good at singing your praises when life goes as we want it to. We are eager to receive your blessings, but reluctant to make sacrifices for you. We are happy to proclaim you our king, but hesitant in offering you our service. We welcome, we, we confess that we so quickly forget your teaching. We speak sharply to others and are quick to judge. We fail to take the opportunity to help those that you place before us. And we confess that like Peter, we have at times denied our relationship with you through our silence. Lord, our hearts are in need of cleansing. Forgive us, we pray, and help us to offer you our true allegiance. As we journey through Holy Week, from the joyous procession of Palm Sunday to the sorrow of Good Friday and the triumph of Easter morning, we thank you that you gave your life willingly for us and that it was your plan all along. Such love is too wonderful for us to comprehend, but we give you our thanks with all our hearts. We celebrate your victory over sin and death, making our salvation possible. May this Palm Sunday inspire us to welcome you anew into our hearts, and we pray that you will help us by your spirit to respond to you and to accept your invitation to share in your kingdom. And now let's join in the prayer which you taught to your disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> I wonder whether you've ever waited on the streets for someone famous. Um, should be a picture of coming up of people waiting for on the, on the Oscars for the red carpetry, but uh, so uh, it could be somebody, it could be uh, a celebrity, it could be a sports star, um, it could be it could be uh, somebody member of the royal family. Have you ever queued up to see somebody famous, uh, and uh, what happened? Did you get a selfie? 
Did you get an autograph? Uh, did, did you have to wait a long time? What was the atmosphere like? Would you like to turn to your neighbor and chat about what you saw that time? To you, but I'm So, what, 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 who, 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 who has, who's queued for somebody famous? Who's queued up? Who, who's got a story they'd like to, to share? Jeanette. I waited to see the Queen 10 years ago opening the Yellow Creek Park. You, so, Jeanette waited to see the Queen opening Yellow Creek Park. And, and did, did, were you close? How close? So a passing, yeah. You didn't get a, an autograph or anything. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. So we've had the Queen. Who else has had something? Rex? Uh, Prince Charles, when he opened the Seabird Centre, which I think was the year 2000. 2000, okay. And Anne's nodding. Was that, you saw that too? Okay. So, so we've had the royal family. Who else? Barbara? Way back many years ago, we went to the roadside after the King George VI was crowned when he was doing a tour of the country. King George VI, so that's a wee while ago, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> so more royalty, more royalty. Anne, the Pope. So the Pope in Edinburgh in the late 70s, okay, okay. Jenny? So it's one that, but Jenny's been to see the Rolling Stones. Well, actually, she just ha happened to be there. Okay. Brian, tell us. Back in uh, 1979, when I was still a student of photography in Edinburgh, um, word went out that uh, the greatest film star, the most gorgeous lady of her day, Sophia Loren, was coming to Edinburgh on a book signing tour. So I was actually supposed to be attending a very important lecture <laughs> <laughs> given by one of the world's leading photographers at the time. But given the choice between a lecture on photography such as my dedication, I decided actually going to see Sophia Loren was bastard. <laughs> so when I went down at the allotted time to Princess Street, they had closed off Princess Street, and the crowds were at least four deep. And being of a relatively diminutive stature, I never actually saw something. <laughs> <laughs> so the motorcycle outriders arriving and her limousine arriving. But you did have the option because it was outside John Menzies' store on Princess Street, number 126 Princess Street, to go and buy her book. And if you did that, you could get Sophia Loren to sign the book. So, although I couldn't afford it, I decided it was worth it. So I actually queued up, and the queue in those days, John Menzies' store was four stories high. You bought the book in the basement, and you then queued behind every floor until you got to the top floor where 
as the field where I was sitting. I waited for two hours in the queue to get anywhere near Sophia Loren, and as I edged closer to her and she was within about 10 feet of me, I could not believe how nervous I was and actually how gorgeous Sophia Loren was. <laughs> and when eventually the security guards beckoned me forward to go to the desk where Sophia Loren was sitting, she looked up at me, looked me straight in the eye, and asked, who would you like the book dedicated to? And in my anxiety, I couldn't remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Brian has this wonderful story, and I apologize if you didn't hear it, because, but I couldn't possibly summarize that story. But that is Brian, and Brian will, 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 Brian has got the book with him, with his signature. So, so you can have a chat with Brian afterwards if you, if you need to know more, want to know more about that. Thank you, Brian, for that story. The story I want to tell you, and I had a picture of this, is in, in 1983, I was a student in Aberdeen, and uh, Aberdeen won the European Cup Winners Cup. And the day after, I went down to Union Street, and there's a photograph up there, which shows Union Street absolutely mobbed with people, completely mobbed. The entire center of Aberdeen came to a standstill. And we queued for hours and hours and hours, and eventually the open bus came by. Um, I think it was a bit like that on Palm Sunday when Jesus arrived into Jerusalem. There were thousands and thousands of people queuing and shouting and cheering. Now, I queued or stood for hours to see Aberdeen come by. I don't support Aberdeen. I was hugely proud and chuffed that uh, a Scottish team had won this trophy. And I was delighted to go out and cheer. But do you know something? That day changed nothing. I was a hip supporter before that day, and I was still a hip supporter after that day. <laughs> I welcomed the Aberdeen fans, but I never became an Aberdeen fan. And I wonder on Palm Sunday how many people were like that too. They loved seeing Jesus, they welcomed him, but actually it didn't make any difference. And I wonder today, we've sung that song, make way, make way for Christ the King in splendor comes. We've welcomed him. It's great that Jesus is coming, we said, but does it make any difference? This week, at school, at work, when the choice comes, do I do it my way or does it do it Jesus' way? Which way do we choose? What difference does Palm Sunday make to our lives? Before the young folk go to their activities, we're going to sing the song, Here Comes Jesus on a Donkey.
The first of our Bible readings this morning is from the prophet Zechariah. It's chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, and can be found on page 955 of the Church Bibles. The coming of Zion's king. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. Second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 44, on page 1054. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as a king. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, all the hill at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Amen. We're going to sing, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. And if you want words on paper, they're in the inside of the order of service.
every July, the ceremony of the keys takes place at Holyrood Palace. It marks the start of the week when King Charles is going to be based in Edinburgh. The Lord Provost prevents, presents the monarch with the keys to the city. As the great and the good watch on, the keys are offered to the monarch on a red velvet cushion. It's more than a welcome, it's an expression of loyalty. And it dates back at least to Mary Queen of Scots in the 1560s. Hundreds of years ago, Edinburgh was a walled city. It had gates that could be closed to keep kings and queens and their armies out. In all likelihood, the ceremony of the keys took place at one of these gates. An advance party would bring news that the monarch was arriving. The city council then had three choices. The first option was to close the gates. The gates would be locked and the message would be quite clear. We don't want you to be our ruler. Go away. To close the gates was a gesture of rebellion. A second option would be to leave the gates open and ignore the king. No obstacle was put in the king's way, but equally nothing done to welcome him. A calculated snub. Let the king come. He's free to go out his business. He's irrelevant. The third option was to welcome the king. The Lord Provost, the town council, would turn out in force. At the gate, the Lord Provost would greet the king and say how thrilled they were to see him. Then as a sign of loyalty and obedience, the keys to the city would be handed to the monarch. Three options. To defy the king, to ignore the king, to welcome the king. When Jesus arrived at Jerusalem, what happened? Did the city defy him? Did it ignore him? Did it welcome him? All four Gospels describe Jesus arriving. Another entry took place at much the same time, both similar and different, not mentioned in any of the Gospels. Israel in those days was part of the Roman Empire. Jerusalem and the province of Judea was governed directly by Rome. The current governor was Pontius Pilate, and he spent most of his year in Caesarea, which was 70 miles to the west of the city. Every year at Passover time, he traveled to Jerusalem. Not to worship, he came with extra soldiers to reinforce the garrison. He came so he was on the spot to take charge if trouble erupted. So about the time that Jesus is arriving from Jericho in the east, Pilate is arriving from Caesarea in the west. And undoubtedly, when Pilate arrived, something like the ceremony of the keys would have taken place. Jerusalem did not dare rebel. To ignore the governor would be folly. So the chief priests, the other leading members of the Sanhedrin, would wait at the city gate. When Pilate arrived at the head of the cavalry, the chief priests would welcome him and say how delighted they were that Pilate was once again back in Jerusalem. When Jesus arrived from the east, what happened? Did the chief priests turn out? Was he given the keys to the city? There is no doubt Jesus was claiming to be king. The passage which David read to us begins with these instructions that he gave to his disciples. Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. In those words which perhaps you've heard many, many times before are four clues that make it very clear Jesus was claiming to be king. The first clue is Jesus decided to ride. Until now, Jesus has walked everywhere. In this particular occasion, he's traveled from Galilee in the north all the way down to Jerusalem, and he has walked every single step of the way. Why did he choose to ride when he's walked? Why was the last lap of the journey on a back of an animal rather than on foot? Because kings don't walk into cities, they ride. Clue number one. The second clue is that Jesus chose a donkey rather than a horse. 
To us, to ride a donkey seems unkinglike. Until we remember those words from Zechariah in the Old Testament that David read also. Zechariah had looked forward to a day. He said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Jerusalem. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In choosing not just a donkey but a colt, Jesus was claiming to be the king Zechariah had spoken of. The third clue is that this colt had never been ridden. To us, that sounds daft. If you're wanting to make a statement, the last thing you'd risk is an animal that has never had anybody on its back. That's asking for trouble. Except back then, an animal which was never been ridden was considered sacred, fit for a king. To choose an animal that had never been ridden was Jesus claiming kingship. And the fourth clue is that Jesus took without asking, let alone paying. It's kings who have the right to requisition. If anyone asks what you are doing, say the king needs it. Baby Jesus lying in a manger, completely unthreatening. He doesn't upset our priorities. He doesn't challenge our choices. Jesus in Galilee, healing the sick, welcoming the outcast. We feel drawn to him and we want to be with him. Jesus riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday is different. This Jesus is throwing down the gauntlet. This Jesus is claiming to be a king. And kings do things like requisitioning other people's donkeys. This king has a right to make demands now as well as then. The Jesus we meet on Palm Sunday is unsettling. As he enters Jerusalem, he's claiming to be king, and not just then, today too. King Jesus upsets our ordered routines, disturbs our priorities, because kings come first. When the king says, jump, we don't ask why, we ask how high. King Jesus is unsettling. What will we do as we meet him this Palm Sunday? Maybe some of the responses that we see in the people who met him then can help us work out what we will do. First of all, some people ignore Jesus. To ignore Jesus then and now is the first of the responses. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he went straight to the temple. It was absolutely buzzing. Passover was peak season for temple traders. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims had come to worship at the temple. Their worship involved around sacrificing animals. All these pilgrims needed to buy an animal to sacrifice. So part of the temple had become the busiest, noisiest animal market you can imagine. The traders were selling animals as fast as they could. They had no time to think about Jesus. They weren't for him. They weren't against him. All that mattered was that pilgrims were coming and lining their pockets. Jesus was nowhere on their radar. They ignored him completely. Maybe you like to think of yourself as a tolerant person. You believe that everyone is entitled to believe what they want to. So when it comes to Jesus, you're neither for him or against him. You believe it's important that Christians are free to worship, but that's as far as it goes with this. Your life is busy, there's lots going on, and most of the time, truth be told, you ignore Jesus. The traders ignored Jesus. Jesus did not return the compliment. Jesus was not willing to ignore him, them, as they ignored him. He took their offense at their presence in the temple. He drove them out. He said the temple was supposed to be a place of prayer and they turned into a den of robbers. You know, maybe the traders were taking an excessive profit. Maybe they were abusing the system, but to drive them out, to kick them out completely? Why didn't Jesus reform the system? Why didn't he negotiate? 
It turns out that to ignore a king is a dangerous thing to do. Kings don't take kindly to being snubbed. Kings take exception when people fail to respond to them. Many people today are happy to tolerate Jesus and assume that Jesus will take the same response to them. That's to fall into the trap the temple traders fell into. Their rude awakening shows us what happens if we do that. So if ignoring Jesus is one response, a second response is to ask Jesus just to turn it down a little. Full on Jesus can be a little overpowering. And so sometimes we're tempted to ask Jesus just to tone it down. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. Thousands of pilgrims are shouting, cheering, getting so excited. And some Pharisees in the crowds are feeling distinctly uncomfortable. They turn to Jesus and they say to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to tone it down. Tell them they're being a bit over the top. Ask them to rein it in. The Pharisees were people who, like their faith, served chilled. Theirs was a respectable, a sober faith. They were people who liked to come to church on Sunday and find everything as expected, everything done calmly, properly, without too much excitement or emotion. No fuss, no drama, no shouting, no waving of hands, no crying, no one getting carried away. Very Presbyterian. <laughs> we Presbyterians, like our faith, serve quite chilled. Lots of head, not so much heart. A faith that's nicely ordered, where everything is kept in its proper box. It turns out, Jesus doesn't like being put in a box. And it may be that in effect, you probably wouldn't have said it and organized it this way, but actually, that what actually has happened is that you have a box which is your Sunday box. And in the Sunday box, you come to worship, you serve in some way within the life of the church, you give a good, a significant proportion of your money, and that's your Sunday box. And at the end of today, you move out of the Sunday box into the rest of the week box. And in the rest of the week box, it's a bit different. At work and at home, with our friends and in the community, Jesus is no longer calling the shots. On Palm Sunday, we discover that Jesus isn't prepared to stay in the Sunday box. And what that means is that the way you treat your wife at home concerns him. The fact that you might use half-truths at work in order to get ahead isn't okay. And the stuff you post on social media to get better credit, contraction, that matters too. Like the Pharisees that day, Jesus on Palm Sunday leaves us feeling uncomfortable. We try to explain to him that we're on his side and he's making life difficult for us. We ask him to tone it down a little, to back off so that we can still be for him because we don't want to be against him. And Jesus refuses. He dismissed what the Pharisees asked. And he does the same with us because that's what kings do. Kings make demands. Kings require allegiance. When a king says, jump, the answer is not, would it be okay if I hopped? When kings say, jump, the answer is, right away. The traders thought they could ignore Jesus. The Pharisees wanted him to tone it down. The third response is that of the crowd. The crowd crowned him. That's what they did. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the cheering crowds hailed him as their king. And the text mentions two small details which make this quite clear. Earlier, I mentioned that Jesus sent the disciples, two disciples, to go and get a colt. And the text continues in this way. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. 
It doesn't say that Jesus mounted the colt or that Jesus sat on the colt's back. It says that Jesus was placed on the animal, which was an act of enthronement. Do you remember the coronation of King Charles last year? He did very little. Garments were placed on him. Items were given to him. He didn't, for example, pick up the crown and put it on his own head. The Archbishop of Canterbury placed it on Charles's head while he sat on the coronation chair. On Palm Sunday, Jesus was placed on the donkey. The people who did this were saying, you are our king. And the second detail comes in the shout of the crowd. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, pilgrims shouted, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They were quoting Psalm 118, the words we said at the very beginning of our service in the call to worship. Except they made one small change. They said, blessed is the king And if you look up Psalm 118, you'll see it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The psalm says, blessed is he, and they said, blessed is the king. It couldn't be clearer. The crowd had decided Jesus was their king. They wanted to claim Jesus as king, so they changed the words of the psalm to make it clear. Is Jesus king in your life? Jesus says to me, he says to you, come and follow me. It's more than an invitation, it is a demand. For the Jesus who calls us king, he's a good and gracious and kind king, but make no mistake, he is king. And he requires our loyalty and allegiance. Is Jesus king in your life? Have you surrendered control to Jesus? Have you said, I confess Jesus as Savior and Lord? And if you haven't, what's holding you back? Perhaps it's because you like to be in control. And I get that. I hate being told what to do by anyone. So, for example, if I see a sign that says, do not walk on the grass. I have this overwhelming urge to go and walk on the grass right then because how dare anyone tell me I'm not to walk on that piece of grass? That's what I'm like. So why should I surrender control of my life to anyone? In 1971, the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. At the time, Tom Landry was the coach and Roger Staubach, the quarterback. In American football, the coach decides the moves and the quarterback executes them. Landry was a genius coach and Staubach knew it. Later on in life, he was being interviewed and he talked about what it was like being the quarterback and having to follow what the coach said. And he confessed that he found it really, really difficult to follow the instructions. After all, He was the quarterback, not Landry. He was playing the match. The coach wasn't. Why did he have to do what the coach told him? Not just in the Super Bowl, but every single time he played, Laubach faced a battle. He could ignore the coach and follow his own ideas, or he could listen to the instructions and do what the coach wanted. At every loose start, Coach Landry would tell him, Either run, pass, kick. And every time he had to decide whether he was going to do what the coach said or whether he was going to just do his own thing. When he listened to the coach, he discovered that the coach could see things that he couldn't see and knew things that he didn't know. And so when he listened to the coach, the team played so much better. It won more matches, including the Super Bowl, the ultimate prize. And when he did his own thing, it all fell apart. When he let the coach be the boss, things worked out. When he decided he was going to be the coach, the boss, it didn't. Jesus is a good king, 
He calls us to follow him, not because he wants to ruin our lives, not because he wants to mess about with us and he gets a kick out of being in control. He does it because he wants us to experience life. God intends us to have life. And the life that God intends for us comes when we live it his way. When we make Jesus Lord rather than doing our own thing. And that begins when we surrender our lives to Jesus. Have you done that? Have you taken that fundamental step of saying, Jesus, you are my Lord and I'm going to follow you? And having done that, it continues with a life of allegiance. Every single day, every follower of Jesus faces the battle that Roger Staubach faced every time he went onto the pitch. Will I do it my way? Or will I do what the coach is saying? So every day, we offer our life, we offer the day to Jesus. As Jesus was placed on the colt by his disciples, we place Jesus on the throne of our lives. As the pilgrims changed the words of the psalm to call Jesus king, we change the theme tune of our lives from I did it my way to I will do it your way. Three groups. The traders who ignored Jesus, the Pharisees who asked Jesus to turn it down, and the pilgrims who crowned Jesus. Which group are you in? Is today the day you surrender to Jesus and call him king? And if Jesus is king, what are the areas where you are battling to take back control? Amen.
We come now with our prayers for ourselves and others. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, on this Sunday, as we recall your peaceful entry into the holy city, not on a war horse, not as a military leader, but on a donkey, the symbol of peace. We pray for peace in our hearts, our homes, in the community, and in the world. Inspire us to carry forward the message of justice and peace that you brought to Jerusalem. Come afresh to our troubled world with all its needs, its tensions, its problems, and its evils. Come again to bring healing where there is division, love where there is hatred, and hope where there is despair. We pray for this world to whose service you have called us in all its longing for peace, for justice, and for reconciliation. We particularly cry out to you for the people of Gaza and Israel. We pray that the international community and peacekeeping forces are able to bring pressure to bear on both sides to enable negotiations to take place which lead to a permanent ceasefire and a long-term solution to the problems in that part of the world. Hear our prayers for those forced out of their communities by war and who seek refuge elsewhere. Bless those offering a welcome to asylum seekers here in the UK. We see the results of war on our TV screens, the devastation and the hunger. We see children who are cruelly undernourished and ask that aid agencies are able to supply food to all those who desperately need it. Lord, we lift up to you those who struggle against tyranny wherever it exists, in Belarus, Myanmar, Cuba, North Korea, Afghanistan, and Iran. And today we pray for the people of Hong Kong, whose civil liberties have been further eroded by the passing of a new national security law. We see the election results in Russia, and we could despair, but we trust that you are in control. We pray for freedom, justice, and peace in that land, and an end to war in Ukraine. We pray too for peace in Haiti, that there will be an end to gang violence and a return to stable government. And we pray for your comfort for all those impacted by the terrorist attack in Moscow. Bless all who are ill. We ask a special blessing on those who have received a cancer diagnosis and who are beginning chemotherapy treatment. We pray for our King, Charles, and the Princess of Wales as they begin their treatment and we give thanks for their openness about their illness, which is an encouragement to others. Loving Lord, draw near to those who are grieving the loss of a loved one and those who are caring for a relative who is at end of life. Bless those in hospital, those awaiting surgery, and those making recovery and are able to come home. We pray for all who feel alone, who are having to fend for themselves, whose health is failing, and who fear for the future. May they know your presence and healing love. And now, Lord Jesus, we bring you our offerings, which we dedicate to your use, and with them we dedicate ourselves 
to your service and to the service of one another. For Jesus' sake, amen. To close our service, we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, and this is in the hymn book at number 367. The Father enfold you, Christ uphold you, Spirit keep you in heaven's sight. So may God grace you, heal and embrace you, bring you through darkness into the light. Amen. <laughs>